beginning to think of the title of the conference, what would Jörn Utzon do now, I first thought of the aging and the character and quality of the late works of uh, some of the greatest of artists and architects uh, of all time, from Michelangelo's emo uh, emotionally overwhelming Rondadini Pietà, which he is known to have worked on six days before his death. Claude Monet's divine late paintings of the years that he was losing his eyesight, uh, which enfold the entire world in a wonderfully caressing atmosphere of beauty. While some cre uh, uh, geniuses turned sentimental during their final years as Frank Lloyd Wright in his fantasy architecture, suggesting the fables of the Thousand and One Nights, or embittered Picasso in his late paintings of urinating women and his own skull-like autoportrait. Others have opened up entirely new visions to the future of their own art form, such as Piet Mondrian with his Broadway Boogie Woogie and Le Corbusier in his project for the Venice hos Hospital, both suggestive of structuralist art rather than the compositional modernity. The late masterworks of Sigurd Leverenz also come to mind when thinking of uh, old age and creativity. Uh, indeed, what would Utzon have done if he had had the chance to um, continue his uh, work after the Sydney masterpiece without having a sense of disappointment. However, instead of speculating on what Utzon would do today, I will ask what should we learn from his thinking and design work in our troubled time today. The essential perspective of Utzon's work is surely the rigorous interplay of tradition and newness, uh, precedent and innovation, past and future, geometry and natural growth. As architecture today tends to turn either to obsessive aestheticization or pure instrumentality without being able to evoke deep experiences of existential and collective meaning, the lessons of how, uh, how to rediscover the narrative, mythical, and symbolic power of architecture and its essential sense of life are crucial today. I am going to juxtapose the work of two extraordinary architects uh, of last century, Louis, Louis Kahn and Jörn Utzon. However, before speaking about the significance of the work, work today, I wish to say something about today itself, especially of the loss of uh, the epic sense, epic scope in today's art and architectural art. 
which I would characterize by the notion of the vertigo of now nowness. We live in a time that is flattening into a thin sense of the presence, of the present. But can there be meaningful art without a deep and mysterious echo? An interest in the significance of tradition is today usually seen as nostalgia and conservatism. Seeking understanding and inspiration from alien cultures, <coughs> not to speak of vernacular traditions, is likewise seen as eclecticism or overly uh, nost no uh, nostalgic in our age. Obsession with process, our, uh, sorry, obsessed with uh, progress, our eyes are exclusively fixated on the present and the future. During the past few, dec past few decades, uniqueness and newness have become the sole criteria of quality in architecture, design, and art. Early modernity could still be inspired and guided by lessons of classical architecture as well as vernacular traditions. Just think of Le Corbusier's, uh, Le Corbusier or the other pioneers of modernity. But today, architecture seems to advance in an autistic visual world of unrelatedness. This independence is currently reinforced by technical, uh, by di digital technologies such as uh, beam computational processes and simulation. In fact, simulation finally threatens to eliminate the human meaning altogether. The coherence and harmony of landscapes and cityscapes and the rich historical layering are not anymore seen as essential objectives of architecture. Uniqueness and formal invention have in fact replaced the quest for existential meaning and emotive impact, not to speak of the desire for a spiritual dimension or beauty. The loss of the sense of historicity and evolutionary course is cl clearly becoming a major concern in numerous countries developing at the accelerated rate of today's aggressive investment strategies. Expedient methods of construction and universal architectural fashions. But is newness a relevant aspiration and criteria of quality in art and architecture? Is a future without its foundations in the past even conceivable? Our ultra materialistic and hedonistic cult consumer culture seems to be losing its capacity to identify essences of life and experience as well as to be deeply affected by them. Everything that once was directly lived has become mere representation as Guy Debord laments in his book, The Society of the Spectacle. Quality nuance and expressive subtlety are replaced by such quantifiable aspects as size, uh, loudness, shock value, and strange, strangeness. The superficial interest in uniqueness and newness shifts the artistic encounter from a genuine and autonomous experience 
to a comparative and quasi-rational judgment. Intellectual speculation replaces emotive sincerity and experiential quality is unnoticeably replaced by quantitative assessment. From the celebrated buildings, sorry, even the celebrated buildings of our time have often turned into mere architectural adver advertisements. Newness is expected to evoke interest and excitement whereas any reference to the traditions of the art form in question, not to speak of intentionally attempting to strengthen the continuum of tradition, are seen as reactionism and a source of boredom. Already in the 1980s, uh, Germano Celant, one of the postmodern critics of the time, used such notions as contemporaryism, hyper-contemporary, terror of the contemporary, and the vertigo of nowness, and referred to a pathological and conformist anxiety that turns the, the present into an absolute frame of reference, an undisputable truth. Today, we can undoubtedly speak of a vertical of newness when thinking of the scene of art and architecture during the first uh, decade of the third millennium. New artistic images keep emerging like, uh, like an unending rainfall of images, to use an expression of Italo Calvino. The constant and obsessive search for newness has already turned into a distinct repetitiousness and monotony. Unexpectedly, the quest for uniqueness seems to result in sameness, repetition, and boredom. Newness is a formal surface quality without a deeper mental echo that would energize the work and its repeated encounter. The Norwegian philosopher Lars Svensen points out this paradoxical phenomenon in his book, The Philosophy of Boredom. This is what he writes. In this objective, something new is always sought to avoid boredom with the old. But as new is sought only because of its newness, everything turns identical because it lacks all other properties but newness." End of quote. Boredom with the old replaces, uh, is replaced by boredom with the new. Artistic newness is generally associated with radicality. The new is expected to surpass, sorry, to surpass previous ideas in quality and impact and to cast prevailing traditions from the throne. But is there really any identifiable progress in art and architecture? Or are we only witnessing changing approaches to funda fundamental existential motives. Doesn't every artwork from the first one to the last uh, have the same fundamental message? And that message is, this is how it feels to be a human being in this world. What is the quality that makes us experience a 25,000 year old cave painting, or in case of Australia, Australian rock art, even older, um, with the same effect and impact as any work 
of our own day. Hasn't art always been engaged in expressing the human existential condition? Shouldn't art be oriented towards the timeless questions of existence rather than the appeal of the momentary and fashionable? Shouldn't art and architecture seek deep and permanent essences of human existence instead of obsessively trying to generate a passing experience of uh, newness? I do not believe that any profound artist is directly interested in newness or self-expression as art is too seriously engaged in deep existential issues to be concerned with such passing aspirations. No real writer ever tried to be contemporary, Jorge Luis Borges asserts bluntly. Newness is usually related with extreme individuality and self-expression, but self-expression is another questionable objective in art. Indeed, since the emergence of the modern era, art and architecture have increasingly been seen as areas of self-expression. However, Baltus, whose real name is Count Balthasar Klosowski de Rola, one of the finest figurative painters of the 20th century, expresses a converse view when he says, if a work only expresses the person who created it, it wasn't worth doing. <laughs> Expressing the world, understanding it, that is what seems interesting to me. Later, the painter reformulates his agreement, uh, so his uh, argument. Great painting has to have universal meaning. This is really no longer so today. And this is why I want to give painting, painting back its lost universality and anonymity. The more anonymous painting is, the more real it is. Echoing the painter's view, I wish to say that we also need to give architecture back its lost universality and anonymity. Because the less subjective architecture is, the more real it is. And the more it has the capacity to support our individual identities. The more subjective a work is, the more it focuses on the subject, uh, subjectivity of the author whereas works that are open to the world provide a ground of identification for others. Just think of the assuring sense of the real evoked by the vernacular building traditions around the world. In his Harvard uh, lectures of 1939, Igor Stravinsky, the arc modernist and arc radical of music, presents an unexpectedly uh, forceful criticism of artistic radicalism and the reje rejection of tradition. He writes, the ones who try to avoid subordination support unanimously the opposite counter-traditional view. They reject constraint and they nourish a hope always doomed to failure of finding the secret of strength in freedom. They do not find anything but the arbitrariness of freaks and its disorder. They lose all control, they go astray. <coughs> In the composer's view, the rejection of tradition eliminates the communicative ground of art. The requirement for individuality 
an intelli in, uh, and uh, intellectual anarchy constructs its own language, its vocabulary and artistic means. The use of proven means and established forms is generally forbidden and thus the artist ends up talking in a language with which his audience has no contact. His art becomes unique indeed in the sense that its world is totally closed and it does not contain any possibility for communication. The fact that Stravinsky's Rite of Spring was considered so radical at its time that the premiere in Paris in 1913 turned into a cultural street, uh, street riot gives an added significance to the composer's view of the dialectics of tradition and artistic, free, uh, artistic radicalism. I wish to reiterate that newness and uniqueness alone are hardly relevant aspirations for art. Meaningful artistic works are embodied existential expressions that articulate experiences and emotions of our shared human situation. Works of art, from poetry to music, painting to architecture, are metaphoric representations of the human uh, experience and encounter with the world. And their quality arises from the existential content of the work. That is, its capacity to represent and experientially actualize and energize this very encounter. Great works of architecture and art restructure, sensitize, and enrich our experiences of the world. As Maurice Merleau-Ponty significantly points out, we come to see not the work of art, but the world according to the work. A fresh and sensitized articulation of the fundamental art artistic issues gives the work its special emotive power and life force. Constantin Brancusi formulates the artistic aim force forcefully. The work must give immediately at once the shock of life, the sensation of breathing. This master sculptor's requirement also applies to architecture. An architecture that does not evoke sensations of life remains a mere formalist exercise. Formal and sociological criteria and preconceptions, such as uniqueness, have only a subservient value in relation to the mental task of art. When art is seen in its existential dimension, uniqueness as a formal quality loses its significance. Another arc radical, Ezra Pound, the imagist poet, also confesses his respect for tradition and the historical continuum of various arts as he points out the importance of the ontological origins of each art form. Music begins to atrophy when it departs too far from dance. Poetry begins to atrophy when it gets too far from music. Similarly, in my view, architecture turns into mere formalist visual aesthetics when it departs from its originary motives of domesticating and celebrating space and time for human occupation. Through distinct primal encounters such as the four elements, gravity, verticality, and horizontality, as well as the metaphoric representation of the act of construction itself. Architecture withers 
into a meaningless formal game when it loses its echo of the timeless myths and traditions of building. Instead of portraying newness, to, uh, true architecture makes us aware of the entire historicity of building and it restructures our reading of the continuum of time. The perspective that is often disregarded today is that architecture structures our understanding of the past just as much as it suggests images of future. Every masterpiece, sorry, every masterpiece illuminates the histo history of the art form and makes us look at earlier works in new light. Quote, when one writes verse, one's most immediate audience is not one's own contemporaries, let alone posterity, but one's predecessors, end of quote. Brodsky, Joseph Brodsky asserts, why wouldn't the observation of a Nobel laureate poet also apply in architecture? Let me be clear, I do not support nostalgic traditionalism or conservatism. I wish to argue that the continuum of culture is an essential, although mostly unconscious, ingredient of our lives as well as of our individual creative work. Creative work is always collaboration. It is collaboration with countless other thinkers, architects and artists, but it is collaboration also in the sense of humbly and proudly acknowledging one's role in the continuum of tradition. Every innovation in thought, both in sciences and the arts, is bound to arise from this ground and be projected back into this most honorable context. Anyone working in the mental sphere who believes he, she has arrived at his, her achievement alone is simply blindly self-centered or naive. Architectural and artistic works arise in the continuum of culture and they seek their role and position in this continuum. Jean Genet expresses this idea of presenting the work to the tradition touchingly. In its desire to acquire real significance, each work of art must descend the steps of millennia with patience and extreme caution and meet, if possible, the immemorial night of the dead so that the dead recognize themselves in the work. When a work of apparent, apparently extraordinary uniqueness is not accepted in this ever-expanding gallery of artistic tradition, it will be quickly forgotten as a mere momentary curiosity. On the other hand, even the most original and revolutionary work that touches upon essential existential qualities, um, despite its initial novelty and shock value, ends up reinforcing the continuum of artistic tradition and becomes part of it. What would our under, for instance? This is the basic paradox of artistic creation. The most radical of works end up clarifying and strengthening tradition. The Catalan philosopher Eugenio Dors gives a memorable formulation to this paradox. Everything that remains outside of tradition is plagiarism. The philosopher's cryptic sentence 
implies that works of art that are not supported and continuously revitalized by the constant blood circulation of tradition are doomed to remain mere plagiarizations in the realm of arrogant and pretentious newness. These works do not have an artistic life force and they are doomed to turn into mere curiosities of the past. The most eloquent and convincing defense of tradition is surely T.S. Eliot's essay entitled Tradition and Individual Talent in 1929, but its wisdom has been sadly forgotten today. The poet states that tradition is not a, sta a, a static thing to be inherited, preserved, or possessed, as true tradition has to be reinvented and cre recreated by each uh, new generation. Instead of valuing mere factual history, the poet argues for the significance of a historical sense an internalized mental dimension. It is this historical sense that lies, that ties the artist and the architect to the continuum of culture and provides the backbone of his, her language and its comprehensibility. The fundamental issues of identity in terms of the question, who are we and what is our relationship to the world are constitutive. This historical sense also brings about collective cultural meanings as well as a societal purposefulness. It is this historical sense that gives profound works the combined humility, patience, and calm authority, <coughs> whereas works that desperately aspire for novelty and uniqueness always appear arrogant strained and impatient. Great works of art and architecture cannot arise from cultural ignorance. They emerge in the midst of the evolving story of the history of the art form. The masterpieces emerge equipped with an unexplainable capacity for eternal comparison and dialogue. I want to repeat that I do not wish to praise tradition because of a nostalgia for the past. Neither am I speaking about traditionalism as an alternative to individual invention, but about an embodiment of the essence of tradition as a necessary precondition for meaningful creativity. I speak about the value of tradition because of its fundamental significance for the course of culture and human identity, as well as for the arts or any other creative endeavor. Tradition maintains and safeguards the collective and accumulated existential wisdom of countless generations. It also gives a reliable direction to the new and ma maintains the comprehensibility and meaning of the new. We can, uh, we can appreciate the genuinely new of our own town, time because of Dante, Michelangelo, and Shakespeare. At the same time, the authentically new in our own art helps us to understand the arts of the past. It is evident that artistic meanings cannot be invented as they are mostly unconscious sorry, and pre-reflective existential re-encounters of primal human experiences, emotions, and myths. As Alvaro Siza has written, architects don't invent anything, they transform reality. In the case of Siza himself, this attitude of humility has produced more lasting qualities in architecture than the self-assurance of many of 
his more celebrated colleagues who have deliberately adopted the role of uh, radical formal, form, formal innovators. The continuum of tradition provides the ground from which all human meaning arises. Architectural meaning is always contextual, relational, and temporal. Absolutely, it cannot be uh, invented. Great works achieve their de density and depth from the echo of the past, whereas the voice of the products of superficial novelty remain feeble, incomprehensible, and meaningless. I suggest that the two architects in uh, the last century who valorize the simultaneous interaction and tradition of uh, uh, interaction of tradition and novelty, precedent and innovation, cross-cultural pollination and architectural autonomy, <coughs> historicity and in individuality, universality and uniqueness, and demonstrate the mental power of architecture are Louis Kahn and Jörn Utzon. The two architects were born at the distance of 700 kilometers and seven, 17 years. Uh, Kahn is usually thought of as an American architect, but um, the Norwegian professor, Per Olof Hjalt, who was uh, in one of, uh, a member of one of uh, uh, Kahn's last uh, students, student groups, has um, uh, assured me that uh, Kahn remained uh, as a Nordic person, a person with a Nordic mentality until his very end. Arguably, the two most powerful buildings of the past century are Kahn's capital complex in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and Utson's Opera House, which uh, in, in fact uh, were taken into use uh, almost simultaneously in the beginning of the 1970s. Both buildings are practically surrounded by water. Kahn's by the shallow delta of uh, the river running next to Dhaka, and Utson's uh, the uh, Sydney Harbour area. Both evoke images, associations, and emotions that can be compared with the sublime power of the greatest buildings of history. Kant's parliament building exerts a stunning and silencing authority akin to the Karnak temple at Luxor and appropriately so as he visited this fortress of pharaonic silence during the design process of the parliament building. The power of Khan's parliament building is something I have never experienced anywhere else. I was practically knocked off my feet when I uh, had my first view of the, the building. The most impressive aspect of the greatness of this building is the fact that it was designed by a Jewish architect, but it became the proud, optimistic, and inspiring symbol of the extremely poor ext Islamic nation. Everyone that I talked with in Dhaka, a taxi driver, portier in a, in a hotel, or waitress was so proud of Louis Kahn's building. They had tears in their eyes. Equally impressively, Utson's Opera House has become the architectural symbol of not only Sydney, but of entire Australia 
and the entire 20th century, we could say. Even more, it is a symbol of the cultural mission of architecture. It speaks of the mythical origins and cosmic aspirations of architecture, evoking the great ritual structures of history. We can easily imagine uh, human sacrifices or, or offerings being made on the terraces here. But it, is all, but it also demonstrates the imaginary, imaginative horizon and technical ingenuity in contemporary architecture. It speaks of the tectonic, tectonic essence of the art of building, but it also suggests a biomorphic essence of architecture. Some of the aspects of the unex, uh, unexecuted interior arrangements in drawings make one think of fractals and emergent geometries which were invented after Utzon had conceived his designs. Both works, masterworks, go a long way beyond any cons uh, consideration of utility into the uh, originary metaphysical and mythical dimensions of construction. They are about human curiosity, daring and pride, and they give all of us a sense of human goodness and value. Both architects drew inspiration from the ancient and alien cultures. Khan from Egypt, Greece and Rome, but equally ed evidently from European Renaissance and French utopians of the Enlightenment, as well as the Bazaar traditions and the architectural fantasies of Piranesi. But in his parliament building, he also drew from Mughal palaces and fortresses. Utzon's sources, as we know, were equally varied and surprising. Chinese, Japanese, Mexican high cultures, and Moroccan vernacular, as well as Hopi and Anasazi settlements in North, Africa, no, North America but also marine design and Chinese construction manuals impacted his work, as well as the complex geometries of Islamic architecture, such as the Great Mosque of Isfahan. But echoes of Frank Lloyd Wright, the Corbusier, and Alvar Aalto can also easily be detected in his work. Khan's work arises primarily from geometry and echoes the ancient construction methods, whereas Utzon's work reflects plastic, la uh, plastic language and the uniqueness of nature, reflecting ideas of natural growth as expressed by Darcy uh, Thompson's influential book on growth of form, first published in 1917, just one year before Utzon was born. By the way, Louis Kahn read the same book as intensely. Utzon read uh, Lin Yu Tang, as we heard yesterday, whereas Kahn was equally uh, much interested in Rabindranath uh, Tagore's writings appropriately for his work in uh, in India. The formal, uh, sorry, both reintroduced the, sorry, uh, the processes of organic serial growth and frequent suggestions um, are frequently suggested by Utzon's work, whereas 
Kahn's architecture always arises from a layered play of additive geometry. Both reintroduced the strategy of Pochet, as evidenced here in uh, uh, San Carlo alla Quattro Fontane in, in Rome by Borromini. Uh, however, this uh, architectural device had been banned by the or modernist ortho orthodoxy of truthfulness, which as a consequence collapsed the exterior and interior expressions into one unified language. The formal and atmospheric richness of Alvaralta's designs also arises from the use, acceptance and use of Porsche, which allows two or several parallel formal <coughs> expressions. Porsche permits several simultaneous architectural narratives in the same way that symphonic music or theater consists of uh, different and often very different uh, uh, parts or acts. Both works are metaphoric ruins. Kahn's parliament is surrounded by an empty um, empty layer of uh, ruin images, whereas uh, Utzon's building suggests a potential ruin which in the maybe thousands of years to come will reveal itself as a carcass of a gigantic prehistoric animal. Both works are about the land and landscape. In fact, both in both cases, both cases create not only the place as an experiential reality, but as the very ground uh, of construction surrounded by water. Landscape as a wider scene or con continuum becomes con condensed into a singular setting like a tabletop in Paul Cezanne's and Giorgio Morandi's still lives. Every great artist, artistic work is a world, an entire autonomous microcosm with its internal coherence and order, its specific gravity and hierarchy as it were. The two buildings project their uniqueness and authority as if they were autonomous kingdoms, like the fantasy cities of Italo Calvino or early Renaissance paintings. They are also magical vehicles. Utzon's opera house is a gigantic ship, whereas Kahn's assembly is equipped for a vertical takeoff. Consequently, Hudson deals with the horizon and uh, Kahn with the axis mundi. They are both Noah's arcs, floating treasuries uh, for the purpose, purpose of saving and protecting human pride and, and dignity. Great works are always dense condensations of imageries. And one image or association leads to the next one. And it is exactly this endless stream of images which is the source for the epic breath. Like all cities, all great architectural works are endless and ex inexhaustible in their contents. Paul Valéry appropriately promises an artist is worth a thousand centuries. At the same time, they are also from the initiation ruins, remains of a past culture of greatness in the way that the smallest of ancient Egyptian objects 
is a silent witness of an era when beauty reigned and ugliness was unthinkable. The buildings which with the deepest, most powerful and lasting emotive impact project an epic dimension. This dimension arises from an inclusive breadth and depth of the meaning of the work. Its capacity to touch and mediate universal meanings of the continuum of culture, life, and the mythical essence of construction. Epic architecture also evokes experiences of time and duration, a thick time as Marcel Proust's work has been described. The impact of an epic, uh, sorry, the impact of an epic work also fuses individual and collective meanings. An epic work conveys a wide spectrum of emotions from tragic tones to rigorous order and from sensuality to joy of life. In contrast to the rare epic works, normal works of architecture and art appear as miniatures, studies, or one-dimensional and aestheticized propositions. An epic work echoes the existential multiplicities, conflicts, and contradictions of life. An epic power is not necessarily limited by more size or scale or apparent thematic simplicity. A Giorgio Morandi still life or Adolf Lossi's miniature Gertner bar in Vienna. Michelangelo's stairway of the Laurentian Library as well as Mark Rothko's paintings evoke epic images and feelings. Most of architectural works uh, merely exist in the realm of utility and aesthetics. And this is increasingly the case of contemporary works. But, do, but true greatness calls for an epic scope and quality. Epic works in art, literature, and architecture are also larger than life in the sense that they evoke dimensions beyond the scope of uh, individual lives and they evoke ideas and ideals. They also turn the depth of time into a haptic experience. This is the lesson of the masterworks of Louis Kahn and Jörn Utzon. Yes, to, uh, this is uh, the lesson of the masterworks of Louis Kahn and Utzon, time in which uh, we uh, do not understand and experience time anymore and our lives have turned into a mad surreal consumption where life, human life itself has become, become turned into a consumption good. Thank you.